We heard earlier during the story for all ages about the many interrelated flood stories that circulated around the ancient world, from India to the ancient Near East, even to ancient North America. And scholars estimate that the Epic of Gilgamesh, though it may have circulated in oral history much longer, was probably written down around 1700 BCE, so about 3700 years ago preceding the biblical flood story in Genesis by as much as a thousand years. And the many similarities between the Epic of Gilgamesh and the story of the flood in Genesis support the theory that in all likelihood the story in Genesis derives from the uh, original or the earlier Epic of Gilgamesh. Who knows in the vagaries of history the very earliest and where that came from. But setting aside that Gilgamesh flood story, a close reading even of just Genesis itself shows that the Bible also preserves two flood stories even within itself. One from the northern kingdom of Israel and another from the southern kingdom of Judah. And to somewhat oversimplify, as I said earlier, it's very likely the first five books of the Bible were stitched together from four independently circulating original documents called J, E, P, and D. The Yahwist, and we hear that as a Y, but Germans came up with it, so they spell it with a J. So the J, E, Elohist, P, Priestly, and D, Deuteronomist, which you kind of hear, that's primarily the book of Deuteronomy. And one of the biggest clues for taking the Bible in its final form as we know it and unstitching it to find those, uh, try to reconstruct those four original sources is the name that the different sources fairly consistently use for God. God is called Yahweh in the J source and Elohim in the E source. For example, if you separate out the E and P strands from the J and D strands, they hold that the divine name Yahweh was not revealed until well into the book of Exodus. So those of you who know your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, not revealed that the, the Israelites didn't know to call God Yahweh until Moses encountered the burning bush. And God said, out of the burning bush, my name is Yahweh. That they didn't know that beforehand. But in contrast, if you read the J source, um, God is called Yahweh in Genesis 2. Or if you look in Genesis 4, 26, we read, at that time, the people began to invoke the name Yahweh. So that's really confusing, except that that hypothesis that these are actually different sources stitched together all of a sudden makes it, the text, make a lot more sense. We see those same major differences in those two flood stories that the Bible um, holds together. According to the book of J, Noah takes seven pairs of each animal. Whereas in the P source, Noah is told to take only two of every kind. We normally just tell the two of every kind story and don't tell the seven of every kind story. Did any of you growing up ever read Genesis for yourself and notice that it actually says seven in this part? Okay. But generally, sometimes we read little excerpts or our teachers and our congregations are following a lesson that just excerpts the story or tells them which verses to read. And you don't read the text for yourself and don't notice that it says two animals here and seven animals here. And that discrepancy is really important for after the flood, which is another part of the story that often isn't told. Because according to the book of J, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every bird and offered a burnt offering on the altar. Now, if you only have two of each animal, what does that mean? You don't have an animal to spare, right? That would mean mass extinction. Uh, but according to the J source, Noah has seven pairs of each animal. So then, yeah, you have a, a spare pair for a burnt offering. Uh, so for the P source, in which only one pair of each animal is taken to the ark, um, I already said this. So there is, uh, it's what happens when I go off script and look at the, okay. There is no such problem for the P source, of course, which holds that no ritual sacrifices happen toward, to, until after the tabernacle is built, almost at the end of Exodus. Uh, moreover, for the P, that priestly source, uh, only the sons of Aaron can make proper ritual sacrifices. And Noah, of course, is not a son of Aaron because Noah was born before Aaron. Let me quickly also mention a few other differences that help distinguish those two flood stories in Genesis. Different animals released as the flood recedes, different lengths of the flood, and different life expectancies of the humans. 
Similar to one of the animals used in the Epic of Gilgamesh that we heard earlier, the peace source says that Noah released a raven in just one time to determine whether the waters had lowered enough and whether there was dry land yet. But according to Jay, Noah sends out a dove and sends it out three times. The J source tells us that the flood lasted 40 days, whereas P tells us one chapter later that the flood lasted for a year and 10 days. Uh, according to the book of J, God says definitively, my spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh, their days shall be 120 years. But consistently in the J source, that's where we see all the, the J is earlier, and that's where we see all the people living a really, really long time, up to like Methuselah, right, uh, who lives like 969 years or something. The editors of the anthology of the books that came to be the Bible, and that's who the Bible is, that word Bible just means books, Biblia in Greek, so if you took Spanish, you hear biblioteca. It just means books. It's an anthology. So the compilers of these books, this anthology that is the Bible, they were perhaps more tolerant of ambiguity, contradiction, and plurality than some of the modern proponents of the Bible. They kept two versions of the creation story. They kept two flood stories. There's other places where you have these doublets. And if you're interested in learning more about these earlier sources behind the Hebrew Bible, a really helpful starting point is books by Richard Elliott Friedman. He's a professor of Jewish studies. He used to be at Berkeley. Now he's at the University of Georgia. He has a popular historical survey called Who Wrote the Bible? It's almost like a detective story. And then he has another book called The Bible with Sources Revealed, and it has different colors. So as you read through uh, the Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, the J source is one color, the P source is another, the editor, you know, they get like bold and italics to mean different things. So it really visually shows you the way scholars are trying to unstitch these, uh, this final form that we know best. And as many of you know, I'm teaching a class at Frederick Community College right now called Banned Questions About the Bible. And it's mostly just about surveying some of these basic scholarly questions that scholars have been asking for well more than a century, but that don't always make their way from the academy to the local congregation. And this discrepancy between how the Bible is taught in college versus how it's taught in congregations, and it's, it's really a, sh a shame, I feel, I mean, it's fascinating to work with these young people, but it's also devastating to grow up in a, a congregation that didn't tell you to ask these questions, and all of a sudden you read the text for yourself, and you're like, whoa, they're right. <laughs> what do I do with this information? Uh, so, but this discrepancy between college and congrega congregational ways of reading the Bible in many cases is one of the reasons I was eager to see what Darren Aronofsky would do with the Noah story. This Jewish kid from Brooklyn, this director of films uh, that are equal parts fascinating and disturbing, like Pi, P-I, not P-I-E, the mathematical Pi, uh, Requiem for a Dream and Black Swan, so these, these very visceral, edgy movies. I was interested to see what Aronofsky could do with the Bible in one hand and $130 million in the other. <laughs> <laughs> and although I think the film is strong in parts, I think it ultimately falls short in some ways. Some of the Hollywood cliches that he ended up having to introduce, the compromises he had to make because he got, you know, you get $130 million and Hollywood gets the final cut of your film. You know, it's, you, you choose your battles. But Aronofsky does fascinatingly trans, uh, translate scripture into screenplay using a very Jewish method of interpretation called Midrash. It's been with us for centuries. And Midrash seeks to fill in the gaps of biblical texts with elaborate details and speculation. So if you've ever been reading the Bible or another, or even just a novel or another scriptural tradition and, and had questions come up, like, I wonder about this, that they don't mention it. What Midrash does is take those questions and run with them and, and speculate and hypothesize. Uh, many critics of Aronofsky's Noah forget that Cecil B. DeMille, if you hold that film, The Ten Commandments, up against the Bible, he took um, many uh, issues of artistic license in 1956 uh, as he portrayed the Bible on the silver screen. He didn't catch anywhere near as much flack as Aronofsky has, but he did stir up some controversy if you go back and look in the papers in the 50s. But what's even more frustrating about some of the criticism of this new film, um, Noah, by Darren Aronofsky, is that those who complain that Aronofsky just made up whole cloth, these transformer-like rock creatures called the Watchers. How many of you have seen the film at this point? Okay, a fair amount. 
Uh, Aronofsky did indeed take significant midrashic artistic license by giving those creatures a huge role in the film, but he didn't make them up whole cloth. As we looked at briefly last week, uh, if you read the uh, book of Noah starting in Genesis 6-5, all those who brought your Bibles can follow along with me. Uh, starting in Genesis 6-5, we read, The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great on the earth, and that every inclina inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the humans that I have created, people together with animals and the creatures things and the birds of the air, for I am sorry I have made them, and Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. But Aronofsky, like any close reader of the biblical text, knows that the biblical story of the flood doesn't start there in Genesis 6-5. It really starts quite a bit earlier, but it definitely uh, includes those first five verses of Genesis, most of which are skipped when in curriculum or, or when it's read in, in congregations. Uh, so I'll read it to you now. So this is starting five verses earlier instead of starting five verses into the Noah story. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, now wait, who are those? The sons of God saw that they were fair and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. The Nephilim, who were they? And also afterwards, when the sons of God went in to the daughters of humans who bore children to them, they were the heroes of old, the warriors of renown. So that's some weird stuff that most people growing up in Christian congregations don't hear, even though it's only six chapters in the book of Genesis. Those, it comes from a lot of strategic uh, reading. <laughs> Those Bible verses sound like they easily can be lifted from stories of the Greek and Roman gods and goddesses disguising themselves and cavorting among humankind. And Aronofsky's Transformer-like rock monsters and his cinematic versions of these ancient midrashim that explore the questions of what the heck are the Nephilim, literally that word means fallen ones. Beyond that, the rest is speculation. And Aronofsky does some interesting speculation, as you'll see if you watch the film. Relatedly, if you hear anyone say that in addition to these rock monsters that he made up whole cloth, even though he didn't, uh, if you hear anyone saying they can't believe that Aronofsky depicted Noah, this biblical hero, passed out drunk and naked after the flood, then feel free to direct them to the ninth chapter of Genesis, which says, quote, <laughs> Noah, a man of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, he became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and, and told his two brothers outside. There's actually a whole lot to say about that, but I'm going to have to but know that for a, a future time. But that's what, the, yeah, that's what the Bible says, and that's what Aronofsky filmed. This scene, of course, is only one of the many scenes of graphic nudity, sex, and violence. Read Song of Songs, chapter 5, if you don't believe me. That would lead any literally shot biblical film to be rated NC-17, if not X or something stronger. But one contemporary meaning of the Noah myth that Noah arguably gets most right or that's most powerful or uh, important for our own day is the choice to make Noah a co-conspirator in the most extreme form of eco-terrorism uh, imaginable. I mean, it really puts like Greenpeace to shame. Uh, destroying humanity so that the earth can heal itself from what humans have done to it. And looking closely at the biblical text, this interpretation is actually not that much of a stretch. Although Noah's Ark has come to be one of the most popular visual murals to paint on the walls of children's nurseries and congregations, I mean, all those animals, they're really cute, right? I mean, you know. You know. Uh, the illustrators of all those pieces of children's art seem to forget the reason all those cute, cuddly animals are streaming onto the Ark is that God, according to the Bible, is committing mass murder on a level that far exceeds genocide. Genocide is way too weak a word for what the Noah's Ark story is about. Genocide is about eliminating the genes of a specific racial or ethnic group. What we're talking about is almost speciesicide. I mean, it's the elimination of almost entire species. There are a few explanations that I can see for why those who tell this uh, children's story of Noah, two children, and painted on the walls of nurseries 
Of course, first, as I've already said, the animals are cute, so that, that's understandable. Second, there is a strong theological tradition that the wicked deserve to be punished. And therefore, not only is God right to kill all the wicked ones, with the exception of the righteous Noah, but also that the story serves as a cautionary tale to children that if they are wicked, God will smite them. I really do think that's one of the reasons that the Noah story is, is painted. I'm not recommending this parenting strategy, uh, but it is out there. We can see it in he, this, this sort of perverse theology we still see from you know, Jerry Falwell, the late Fred Phelps, and that's very much where they're coming from. Third, there's a strong theme, especially in the J source, that all these capricious, cruel acts of God need no more justification than that God is God and we are not. Uh, we, of course, see Greek and Roman gods as well as Hindu gods and other places in world mythology acting in unpredictable, cruel, even monstrous ways, and that's justified because they're gods. Uh, now, you've heard me say before that the invitation of our postmodern world is not to take these myths literally as about some historical story that happened a long time ago, but instead to look for the ways that these ancient myths can speak to the universal human condition. In this case, we have an ancient flood story found in many different cultures that can be seen as inviting us to see archetypally, not literally, that humans are responsible for how we treat each other and how we treat this earth. We're responsible and there are consequences of how we act. And many scientists have taken to calling our geologic epoch the, Anthropo the Anthropocene Age, the Anthropocene Age, because they think anthropology, and that's because we're leaving marks on this earth that if people live thousands of years in the future, they'll be able to see that's when the Industrial Revolution happened and all the fallout. We're leaving marks on the earth that we have a new geologic epoch accordingly. Modern science also has its own word for what Genesis calls a blotting out of the human beings from the earth, together with animals and the creeping things and the birds of the air. Modern scientists call that level of blotting out mass extinction. Keep in mind, though, that we didn't know that any species ever became extinct until fossil discoveries in the 1700s. We thought things had sort of always been this way. But since then, we've come to learn that there have been five, five great mass extinctions during the history of this planet. The first took place some 450 million years ago when living things were still mainly confined to water. The most devastating took place at the end of the Permian period, some 250 million years ago, and it came perilously close to emptying out life from this earth altogether. The most recent and famous mass extinction came at the close of the Cretaceous period. It wiped out, in addition to the dinosaurs, the pleosaurs, the moasaurs, the ammonites, and the pterosaurs. The history of these five mass extinctions on our planet and our current um, precarious situation is explored in detail in Elizabeth Colbert's a really well-written new book called The Sixth Extinction. She's a New, York, New Yorker science writer, so you may have read some of her stuff in the past. And this book, The Sixth Extinction, investigates the case that we may well be in the midst of a new potential mass extinction on this planet. Just last week, the Intergover Intergovernmental Plan Panel on Climate Change, a United Nations group, reported the beginnings of a global catastrophe of potential Noah's flood-like proportions. In the summary of the report in the New York Times, climate change is already having sweeping effects on every continent and throughout the world's oceans. So yes, there are more devastating consequences to come if things don't change rapidly, and they're probably going to happen anyway. Um, it's just a matter of can we moderate them or not. But they're happening already is what we're now learning. Ice caps are melting. Sea ice in the Arctic is collapsing. Water supplies are coming under stress. Heat waves and heavy rains are intensifying. Coral reefs are dying. Fish and many other creatures are migrating toward the poles or in some cases going extinct. Uh, the regular background extinction rate, you really should rarely see it, like in a lifetime. You see like, oh, a creature became extinct. That's really rare. There's all kinds of examples. You can see um, the background extinction rate is very high right now. Oceans are rising at a pace that threaten coastal communities and are becoming acidic as they absorb carbon dioxide given off by cars and power plants, which is killing some creatures or stunting their growth. Slowing climate change is far beyond the capacity of one sermon, of course, but allow me at least to briefly point to a few resources in our Unitarian Universalist tradition that might be able to help. 
One is showing that religion can be open and respectful of science, which leads us as a religious community and a larger movement to take the warnings of climate change seriously. A second resource is our seventh principle, the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. More than 150 years ago, Darwin showed us that we humans are not a little lower than the angels, we're just a little higher than the apes. And when we forget that we're merely just one part of that interdependent web of all existence, and then when you shake one web, or you start clipping strands of that web, the rest of the web is affected. When we forget that, in the words of one bumper sticker, in pushing other species to extinction, humanity is busy sawing off the limb on which it perches. A third resource is the universalist half of our heritage, which began as a rejection of the idea of hell and damnation in the next world, and expanded to a universal, universalism, started as universal salvation, and then became universal concern for all people in this world. The sacrifices and the lifestyle changes that will be necessary to slow the speed of climate change will be significant. But our universalist heritage gives us uh, hope that that shift really is possible. In the words of the late philosopher Richard Rorty, as it turns out, willingness to endure uh, suffering for the sake of future rewards. So it used to be that people would act good in this life so that they would have a you know, good reward in the next world. He says, the willingness to endure suffering for the sake of future reward, it turns out that that is transferable. It's transferable from individual rewards for me to social rewards for all of us. It's transferable from one's hope in paradise to one's hopes, one's desperate hopes for a better world for one's grandchildren. The meaning of the worldwide flood myth both then and now is at least threefold. Human, humans' actions have consequences. All living beings on this planet have been almost eradicated in the past five times. In mass extinction, we should extrapolate, will probably happen again. And do, but do we want to be part of bringing it about more quickly? Three, when global climate change does come, just as in the Noah story, God's not coming to help. There is no divine intervention to save us. That's actually, interestingly, what the Noah, the Noah story tells us. To again quote Rorty, to say that we humans are clever animals, just a little higher than the apes, is not to say something philosophical and pessimistic about us no longer being a little lower than the angels. It's to say something political and to say something hopeful. Namely, that if we can work together, we can make ourselves into whatever we clever animals are clever and courageous enough to do, to imagine ourselves becoming. This is to set aside questions such as, what is man? And to substitute questions such as, what world are we leaving to our great grandchildren? That question echoes the American Indian wisdom that the ideology of industrialization and the ideology of manifest destiny refused to take seriously and in so doing created the climate crisis we now face. May we finally learn now at this very late hour to take seriously that wisdom, not only for how our actions affect ourselves, but how our actions will affect the world into which children seven generations from now will, will be born. How are we called to live differently, to ensure a life-giving world and society, even unto the seventh generation? As we continue to hold in our hearts these concerns, I invite you to stand together as we sing together hymn 1064, Blue Boat. May that blue boat continue to be, to be treated in a way that is our own.